forward. And so today for uh, ESS, we're very excited to have Ryan Trevena. He's a um, graduate student here at UW-Madison, and he'll be talking about development amongst different Danyonin species. And so, uh, yeah, thank you, Ryan. Take it away. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm excited here to tell you about my project and um, look forward to any questions. Um, looks like I... Um, sorry, there's just a uh, something in the middle of my screen telling me that the meeting's being recorded. Apologies. I'll try and work around that. Um, that's fine. All right, so I'll just uh, give you guys some history here of um, kind of where this all all began. Um, so looking into um, the inner specific systems and understanding why we would want to use the Danionan species to do so kind of we, I want to go back and um, understand um, the, the global application here. So um, somatic cell nuclear transfer, nuclear transfer from a differentiated um, epithelial uh, intest intestinal um, epithelial cell um, was, uh, the nucle nucleus from that was tra transferred into a um, frog oocyte that had been enucleated uh, leading to uh, a cloned frog on um, this work was done by Gurdon. Um, it's pretty well known work. Um, so that was that was kind of a big push in this method being used for um, cloning purposes. Um, and then uh, very famously, um, Dolly the sheep was the first mammal to be cloned using this process of taking a, a nucleus from a somatic cell and trans um, transferring that into an enucleated oocyte um, and getting a uh, progeny that was um, effectively a clone from that um, original somatic cell nucleus. Moving forward, uh, there was kind of a big, or um, there was there's a lot of unknown here of, of why did some, sometimes this work why did most of the time it not work? And so um, obviously moving into a model species like um, mice, um, there was a successful transfer, um, a report of a successful transfer from cumulus cell nuclei into enucleated oocytes in mice um, that had developed a full-term um, progeny, which you're seeing in the picture on the right. And since then, there's been countless other animals and species that this has occurred in. Um, but there remains some some issues yet, um, some definite promise. So the idea here is that this system and this um, ability of cloning can be utilized for um, livestock breeders uh, trying to push um, strong genotypes, um, strong lines in their their stocks. Um, preservation of endangered species, and then, which I'll get into a little bit in a second, um, more in depth, and then also generating embryonic stem cells um, for potential regenerative therapies um, using uh, these oocyte clones um, in that manner. Um, however, there's definitely a um, lack of access to host um, oocytes and particularly high quality oocytes. Uh, additionally, ethical considerations arise. Um, that is for, for sure when um, considering uh, something like a regenerative therapy, um, trying to derive embryonic stem cells um, obviously brings in some um, ethical considerations there. Um, and then on a technical um, stance, it's uh, a very low developmental efficiency. Um, all of these examples I've brought up report um, in typically a single digit percentage of um, effective progeny being born to term. Um, and then uh, looking a bit more molecularly, um, this is de derived from genetic and epigenetic instabilities. Oh, and with kind of plays back into accessing the high um, quality oocytes. So considering all of these, um, these uh, problems. There is a derivative method that was uh, 
developed, uh, which is interspecies somatic cell nuclear transfer. And how this works is that in one species, you can uh, take a, a, nu a nucleus and um, use that as your donor nucleus from a somatic cell of that species. In another species, take the egg, having an egg donor, um, enucleating that egg and then transferring the somatic nuclei, nucleus, um, you can then derive clones from um, that egg. From those clones, you can then um, implant these into a surrogate mother and um, effectively get clones back from the species in which you uh, used uh, for a donor nucleus. With that, uh, this addressed the uh, access to oocytes because you can use um, something like a, um, so for example, um, in a reproductive clone, you can use something like a domestic sheep where access to an oocyte is a lot, um, or is, is a lot easier to access um, rather than an endangered species that um, you might not have even a female access to. So um, in the context of conservation, you can utilize this method for, and this has been utilized um, in cer certain circumstances, um, such as the wild mouflon, where they took a, um, a uh, nucleus from, uh, or nuclei from granulosa cells, and then transplanted that into an enucleated oocyte from a domestic sheep. And then that successfully derived this clone that you, you can see um, on the right and its mother behind it, its surrogate mother behind it. And so there is examples of this working. However, there's extremely low efficiencies where um, there's a lot of uh, cost and effort put forth in to derive those, those initial clones and then um, only getting one or two progeny out of it um, remains a lot of questions of why are certain circumstances incompatible. Um, and then in a therapeutic side, uh, there's been a, uh, reports of generating embryonic stem cells from this method. So uh, utilizing a um, enucleated oocyte of a rabbit and deriving human embryonic stem cells from the nuclei um, or using the nuclei of a fibroblast, a human fibroblast. And so this uh, is extremely promising in terms of uh, addressing those um, oocyte access issues and then also ethical considerations, um, seeing as you're not utilizing the human em uh, embryo. So looking a little more into the incompatibility context, there's some key nucleo-ooplasm interactions that are essential for embryonic development. And so, as I've mentioned a few times that there's low efficiencies in both uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer, but also um, definitely in interspecies somatic cell nuclear transfer. And so we're interested in understanding that interspecies context with these two, um, with a couple different um, viewpoints. And so on one side of the coin, you have um, cytoplasm from one species having to interact with a nucleus of another species. And so that brings up the need for um, the mitochondrial, mitochondrial genome to interact with the nuclear genome of two different species. And so what can arise here is incompatibilities between the key factors that, um, that are at the interplay between the mitochondrial genome and the nuclear genome. And this is uh, work that's actively being pursued by another member of our lab, Trevor Chamberlain. Um, and then another key, uh, key process that occurs during uh, development that is essential for um, a successful progeny being um, born is the activation of the zygotic genome. So the zygote needs to be uh, self-sufficient from their genome itself. And I'll kind of get into um, that process a little bit more in a second. But um, this key development, developmental activation 
is uh, the transition from maternal uh, controlled development to the um, zygotic zygote itself being fully um, fully sufficient in its development. And so to kind of give context to this in an evolutionary um, perspective is um, the Dobzhansky Muller uh, model. And so this is an adaptation from that model in that there's an ancestral state of um, where the uh, nucleus and the cytoplasm are interacting. And then from that, there's derivative species, uh, derivative lineages. And so if we're taking a nucleus from uh, species one here and uh, implanting it into or transferring it into the uh, cytoplasm of um, species two, we get uh, effectively a cytoplasmic hybrid. And so what that is, is the hybridization between two species of a nucleus and the cytoplasm. And as I mentioned, um, and what has been uh, kind of this model has been applied to prior is that the mitochondria need to interact um, with the nucleus, the two genomes need to be able to interact. And if there are um, key elements that are have diverged between these two species, that effectively renders these the cytoplasm and the nucleus to be incompatible. Now, an adaptation in the context of um, the zygotic genome activation is that there's also an ancestral state in the egg um, in terms of maternal factors. And so pre-deposited in an egg is a, in an oocyte is, or are, are, are maternal factors and uh, specifically, um, or a subset are maternal transcription factors. And those maternal transcription factors are key to the zygotic genome be, being activated. And they are also key to the uh, initial stages of development. And so if uh, there, and it, because these maternal uh, transcription factors are pre-deposited in the oocyte itself, they're coming from the um, cytoplasm of one species. And then um, that has to interact with the uh, genomic contributions of the other species that you are getting your nuclei from. So um, in the uh, diagram here, um, the, the, check, the check marks here are indicating a successful um, interaction between the, tr the trans maternal transcription factor of one species um, and the zygotic transcript of the uh, donor uh, nuclei or within the donor nuclei. And then if you can uh, kind of adapt here with the idea from the pre previous example is that there uh, between the two species are derivations within the lineage of potentially these key factors. Thus, the maternal transcription factors are not, in a uh, cybrid or a hybrid context, the maternal transcription factors are not interacting um, or regulating the uh, zygotic transcripts correctly, rendering incompatible or uh, causing incompatibility between or in the activation of the zygotic genome which is uh, given in the bottom example where the uh, X's are indicating incom incompatible interactions between these two elements. So my project focuses on these interactions and I'm interested in understanding and interrogating this, the gene expression in a hybrid context and more specifically a cybrid, the cytoplasmic hybrid context. So it's kind of more, uh, more specifically go through this developmental process of the maternal to zygotic transition in an oocyte when uh, fertilization first occurs the initial uh, cycling of development cell cycling and uh, development in general in embryogenesis is maternal the maternal factors that are predeposited in the oocyte from there these become degraded and uh, the zygotic genome 
as that is degraded, becomes active um, based on those predeposited transcription factors that I had mentioned. Therefore, in this interspecies context, we're interested in understanding differential regulations based on um, incompatible interactions at this key time point of the mid blastula transition, where these this first wave of zygotic genes are becoming active. Um, and from those first wave of genes comes the subsequent wave, wave of genes that render the embryo to be fully independently um, active in terms of um, its zygotic genome. And then to bring up also, there's uh, chromatin modifications that are required in this interspecies context as we're utilizing a somatic cell um, that's being transplanted into an oocyte. So it has to not only um, conduct this process or be uh, active in this process of um, zygotic genome activation, but before that, the maternal factors have to silence um, the uh, state in which the nuclei is coming in to return it to a totipotent state. Um, so it can effectively process through the, or um, effectively uh, express the embryonic genes that are required at, these, at this key stage. So my project overview uh, is broken down into wanting to understand these incompatibility, um, the incompatibility of cybrid embryos, these cytoplasmic hybrid em embryos that are generated by interspecies somatic cell nuclear transfer. And we hypothesize that these, this is directed by evolution, evolutionary divergence of key early embryonic factors that drive the nuclear, nuclear reprogramming within the oocyte and conduct the zygotic genome activation. From that, the breakdown is that these changes in key early embryonic factors, um, as those increase, we hypothesize there's aberrations in the first wave zygotic gene regulation, therefore uh, increasing developmental incompatibility along evolutionary divergence. And what that looks like in the context of a lineage itself is, um, what I'll break down with the Danny Onan model. And why we utilize a Danny Onan model is because it lends some really useful tools. So within the Danny Onan uh, lineage is Danny Orario, the um, zebrafish, that is a well-established developmental model system. Um, it's well-characterized in its development. And we can use those uh, as guidelines for what normal development should look like in the context of uh, the zebrafish or the uh, Danny Orario. Additionally, it has relative species along a lineage that um, is within 13 million years, which is um, which has been reported to be a key point in which incompatibility be starts to arise at a higher rate beyond this point. Um, that's there's some leeway there, and there's some uh, conflicting reports to that. But this gives us at least a good subset of species to work with to understand incompatibility interactions. Um, and then also, because we're under we're working with uh, early embryonic development, we want to be able to. Um, there's already well established techniques to work with those embryos, and it's they develop um, externally, therefore we can manipulate them, utilize gene editing um, further down the road to um, start interrogating specific uh, regulatory pathways. So specifically with the Danny Onan incompatibility model, I bring back up um, our the previous model I had mentioned um, to give context to how we view this along evolutionary time. And so uh, ED down here is in indicating an egg donor. That would be the zebrafish. And the we can use that as our um, home base to then systematically test where uh, changes in the nucleocytoplasmic interactions with this egg donor. Does this arise along the lineage? And where that arises, 
it would indicate a compatibility boundary where beyond a certain boundary, the um, capacity for development um, diminishes. So closely related species are competent for development in the cybrid context. Beyond a certain boundary, this becomes um, not, this becomes uh, not competent. And so to look at that in um, more detail, uh, I've done some embryonic staging where uh, looking at time lapse of these embryos during their early uh, early embryonic development th through their point of a uh, midblastula transition. So where that zygotic genome becomes active, um, we start to lay the um, groundwork for what does developmental um, co uh, competency look like in zebrafish. And so the breakdown of how I did this was just mounting uh, embryos in their one cell state in methyl cellulose. And then um, these were IVF generated. Um, and these are both just, uh, they're IVF generated. So they were time matched and they are both within their own species. So they're, uh, Danny Orario is a diploid um, embryo crossed with its with another Danny Orario. Danio X here is just a relative species, uh, Danionin, uh, that is a diploid um, crossed with its own um, intraspecies um, partner. And then the time lapse went through uh, post the mid blast to the transition. So, what this looks like. Um, in a video context is just that, or a time-lapse context rather, is um, a staging of the cell cycling through this uh, this early embryogenesis. And then um, I just utilized a uh, program cell profiler to analyze the, um, the cell divisions and to um, systematically put that onto, or time, these embryos um, with each other. And so the result of this in doing so with uh, three species along the Danionin lineage, um, Chiafid is the most closely related, Elblineatus is um, the next closely related to zebrafish, and then the furthest related or more dis distant related is the Daniel margaritatus, um, all of which demonstrated consistent um, embryonic staging with the zebrafish. Uh, so it all fall, fell within the, the, um, the same time, time lapse uh, or time cycling rather. So that gives us our, our context and our, our baseline to go off of when we then uh, start to generate cybrids, these cytoplasmic hybrids. And um, how we do this is that uh, we use a surrogate system. So we don't do uh, pure uh, somatic cell nu nuclear transfer. We utilize the fact that um, we can enucleate zebrafish uh, oocytes and fertilize them through IVF with a relative species and uh, utilize just uh, fertilization of uh, the other species sperm to um, do the transfer for us, the nuclear transfer for us. Um, and how, how this is done is uh, a couple different ways, but uh, most, most of the data here is derived from a UV method in which we get UV treated uh, oocytes prior to fertilization. Um, and also we uh, treat them with a chemical sorolin, which then um, upon UV uh, light intercalates the DNA um, and effectively enucleates um, the oocyte. Um, and then we go through and fertilize with the other species to drive a haploid uh, androgenetic cybrid. An alternative method that we're developing is using a linear accelerator with cl a collaboration with the medical physics department um, in which we um, are uh, doing so because efficiencies of um, the development of these haploids is um, moderate in the UV, seeing as it's uh, 
UV tends to cause uh, toxicity to the cytoplasm itself and have off-target effects. Um, whereas we're looking for a more um, specific or um, sensitive method in the linear accelerator, um, but a bit of a tangent. Um, so then some embryonic staging with the cybrids themselves. So on the left are three examples of uh, cybrid embryos that um, are, the first is an intraspecies control utilizing the uh, egg of a zebrafish and the sperm of a zebrafish getting a haploid um, embryo that is an androgenetic haploid rather than the cybrid itself. Um, B is a uh, Dani Orario egg crossed with the sperm of an enucleated Dani Orario egg crossed with the sperm of Dani Okiafit, a more closely related species, um, driving a, uh, an androgenetic cybrid um, that looks uh, comparable to that of the haploid, the androgenetic haploid control. Then the more uh, distantly related species, uh, Daniel Margaritatis was crossed to an enucleated um, zebrafish oocyte. And we identified uh, um, incompatibility phenotypes such with the body axis development has been stunted in that the uh, tail has been truncated, the tail outgrowth has been truncated, the, um, there's necrosis, um, in the hindbrain, you can see based on the um, kind of darkened uh, uh, head for context um, here, just if you haven't looked at a zebrafish embryo prior, um, the head is on uh, your left side, the yolk is the large central um, circle, and then the um, expanding vertebrae and tail um, is the extend extending um, uh, point to the right. Uh, from here, the embryonic staging uh, sh demonstrated for us this um, case of incompatibility in the sense of developmental competency. So in the uh, phenotypes that we see with the Daniel Margaritatis cross, we also see a delay at the point um, of made blastula transition, indicating that there are uh, that there are uh, incompatibilities between the regulation of these processes in which we hypothesize is based on um, the divergence of these key embryonic factors, early embryonic factors. Um, so this gives us the context that we need of where perhaps along the lineage, this um, these species start to um, or that compatibility boundary is drawn. So looking at that in just a general sense of the top here are uh, diploid controls, and so in the zebrafish, the uh, diploid control is a zebrafish cross with the zebrafish, and then in all of the other species, it is um, a hybrid. Um, of a relative species and a zebrafish, all of which are diploids. Um, you start to see some, um, again, uh, incompatibility phenotypes with the um, body axis uh, issues of tail development and necrosis in the um, along the phylogenetic relatedness kind of track here. Um, and then on the bottom are the androgenetic cybrids. Um, again, we. I brought these up, but the androgenetic haploid is the intraspecies zebrafish, and then the relative species are the cybrids themselves. Um, you can see in the closely related chiathid, it is um, effectively a normal haploid uh, elbloniatus here, which is kind of the middle of the road uh, in terms of relativity along the lineage. Um, you start to see uh, necrosis, and uh, in Margaritatis. Um, there's the incompatibility phenotypes as well. 
So it starts to lay the framework along the lineage of what incompatibility, what developmental competency looks like um, in terms of phenotype. So taking it a step further into um, fertilization rates and survival rates, um, in terms of fertilization, the closely related Kia fit, I mean, you can see uh, based on the uh, kind of model uh, lineage here on the upper right hand side um, is uh, effectively the same as the uh, Rario controls, um, both in the diploid and haploid contexts. Um, survival rate, again, is comparable in both scenarios with the uh, zebrafish controls. Looking to the albulineatus, the next step further along the lineage um, in terms of phylogenetic relatedness, uh, the fertilization rates actually are similar to the uh, rario uh, or the uh, zebrafish. Um, and so are the survival rates, although it's dipped a bit um, in albulineatus, which um, is shown in the uh, example of a pretty extreme um, incompatibility phenotype um, above. And then in the uh, Daniel Margaritatis cross, um, in terms of fertilization rates, this was consistent, which um, is key because then in survival rates, uh, the Margaritatis cybrid uh, plummets down to um, about 10% uh, of the uh, clutch of a zebrafish, um, or of the clutch that is laid or generated through our uh, cybrid um, methods indicates to us that there is in, a significant incompatibility here um, along this lineage. And it is the most, um, the, the furthest in terms of phylogenetic relatedness. So supporting our hypothesis that along this uh, lineage, the divergence of these key factors lead to um, higher incidence of uh, incompatibility phenotypes. And then just a quick note of uh, uh, how do we know we're getting true cybrids? Are we effectively uh, enucleating the oocytes and not getting hybrids? Um, just relative expression of a um, embryonic uh, gene here in that we designed a primer to uh, the relative species and then utilized embryos from both um, Daniel Rario, uh, haploid, androgenic haploids, and then uh, either Chiathid or Elbloniatus cybrids, um, to which the, um, the cybrids uh, demonstrate uh, higher relative ex expression based on normalized, or, and which is normalized to uh, beta continin constitutively expressed. Um, gene. And these were a, a pool of embryos um, taken at, by at about four hours post fertilization. So just a couple of takeaways for the developmental timing are that um, all species show consistent normalized uh, 15 minute cell cycling between developmental stages in their diploid context. Uh, the Daniel Kiathit and Daniel Elbulineatus um, show embryonic staging to be normal, uh, that normal 15 minute cell cycling. Whereas uh, Daniel Margaritata cybrids uh, demonstrate a uh, aberration along that the uh, embryogenesis at the point of mid-blastular transition, which is consistent with the developmental defects we see um, in the uh, embryos later on. So then taking a uh, step into the um, wondering what is, uh, what's going on in terms of gene expression. So um, to bring our guide back hey, up. Hey, Ryan. You know, yeah. Sorry, the slides haven't, um, oh, okay, they just updated. Never mind, they weren't moving for a little while. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> okay, I can see, is the slide you're supposed to be on integrating first wave gene expression? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank, Thank you.
Okay, so let me, uh, I can clarify anything if, if there are questions, but um, apologies for that. Um, so interrogating the first wave uh, gene expression, wanting to zone into uh, any changes in regulations of these first, the first genes that are being um, expressed in the zygotic genome at the point of zygotic genome activation, which is key because these are the genes that are being um, regulated by the maternal factors that are coming from the other uh, uh, the separate species. Um, to do so, we have designed a, a drug treatment um, approach where um, we effectively are uh, utilizing our, this isogenketin drug um, is utilized to uh, inhibit uh, splicing, pre-mRNA splicing. So it inhibits the spliceosome. Therefore, the uh, intron is not um, excised as it should during transcription. In doing so, we can measure enrichment in intron exon boundary reads, which is key because in order to parse apart the um, first wave from subsequent waves of genes, the, we need to um, block the, zygotic, the first wave zygotic genes from activating those subsequent waves. The subsequent waves are, um, are activated based on that first wave. So, uh, and the first wave is activated by maternal factors. And so by affecting the zygotic uh, transcripts, we can um, it, assess drug treated and untreated to parse apart what is first wave um, and what are subsequent waves and focus in on first waves, first wave genes um, that are being regulated by maternal, the maternal transcription factors of another species. Um, and we assess this at dome stage when the um, first wave gene, um, the uh, time point in which the zygotic genome become or doesn't become, but is um, is active, and the first wave of genes is also active. So, uh, just as a quick point uh, to kind of as a validation of using this drug method again, looking at relative expression of representative first wave genes um, in untreated and treated, so in the untreated, they um, are, um, they're, uh, sorry, the, uh, in the untreated, the, um, these representative genes uh, are showing uh, increased relative expression normalized to beta catenin again. And then we used a housekeeping, uh, gene of beta tubulin, um, which is maternally expressed and constitutively, constitutively expressed. And because it's maternally expressed, it's not affected by um, our drug that is targeting the zygotic transcripts. So establishing the first wave, um, I'll, br I'll break down here. Uh, again, having our model of the utilization of this drug but um, this is an adaptation to uh, work that's already been done in establishing the first wave in zebrafish, um, which has been done in a, in a few different ways. But um, uh, Lee, there was a Lee et al. paper from um, in Nature that uh, established the first wave in a similar context of assessing intron, intron exon enrichment boundaries um, to parse apart subsequent waves from the first wave. So um, in doing, in having that as a, as, a, uh, as a guide, we can assess that what we are detecting as first wave um, as a validation to our drug treatment is um, catching true first wave genes. Um, so the pipeline that we've utilized for this is um, RNA-seq uh, to which we are uh, just commonly uh, aligning, utilizing top hat, and then annotating. At this annotation is which 
uh, is where we assess the intron profile. And so determining the intronic um, uh, levels in drug treated and untreated. And so at that point, we can parse apart in the uh, drug treated, we can assess uh, there, there's going to be an increase in intronic, uh, intronic profile expression. Whereas um, in untreated, those introns, the spliceosome is not inhibited, therefore uh, that should be uh, lowered. And then from there, we can take the, um, the data set that we get from the, uh, those hits that are, um, have a increase in intronic profile, so increase in the intronic expression, and then utilize differential expression um, to parse apart uh, the, those that are increased in, in expression at the point of uh, this dome stage where the zygotic genome is activated um, in order to collect our, um, our first wave genes. And so to point out a couple things just here on the, um, on this volcano plot, I, I've uh, taken only half of our vo volcano plot um, in order to focus in on the first wave because the other side of our volcano plot is um, representative of the maternal um, transcripts that are be being, or that are being degraded. Um, whereas we wanna focus in on the first wave of genes here. And so the increased uh, transcription uh, of these genes would be at this point of dome stage. And um, we utilized a um, false discovery rate, which just indicates a point in which we're looking for a significance. Um, it's a significance boundary basically. And so um, anything above that is going to be what we render significantly um, having a increased fold change expression and that is our first wave of genes. And I point out the MER430 cluster up here because it's a um, polycystron that is uh, key and at a high level of expression that we know is at a high level of expression during, the, um, during this key uh, embryonic uh, process. Therefore, uh, validating that we're catching um, the right stuff basically. Um, and then to tie this kind of into some gene on ontology, kind of bring it back to the systems, regulatory dynamics um, there, tie this back and I, I'll focus in on here, the uh, chromatin enrichment here is, is key because of what we know to be um, re required for the nuclear reprogramming uh, in the cybrid context. Um, of note, I think I might have gone or skipped over this, but this is all within the zebrafish um, control. So this is just a validation of our methods of the drug discovery. Um, these are not in cybrids themselves. Um, that will be next steps um, and in the other species, um, which I'll get to. So just a couple key takeaways in that uh, we're validating that we are identifying the MER430 polycystron. Um, we have a data set that corroborates um, first wave, uh, previously reported first wave genes in zebrafish and um, the drug treatment therefore is sufficient to inhibit splicing. Um, and we can, uh, we're able to compile a first wave gene set based on this. Um, so with that being said, um, the next, next steps here are to compile first wave gene sets for relative species. So then we can start to parse apart where there are differences between these first wave uh, gene sets, which I indicate here by the, the green circles um, of different species here. So zebrafish on the left, uh, closer, rela uh, closer related species like Kiafit in the middle, and then a more distant related species um, such as Margaritatis on the right, where you're starting to see more uh, or changes in uh, differential gene expression, which we hypothesize to be because of uh, incompatibilities in the uh, maternal transcription factor regulation of these genes. Uh, and kind of the 
hallmark here is then to compare first wave gene differential um, expression patterns between the species um, at this key time point to identify key um, to then uh, in a uh, kind of uh, backwards method of identify the differential gene expression patterns and then uh, identify the transcription factors that are maternal transcription factors that are responsible for regulating such and use those as uh, um, to interrogate and validate uh, if they are key players in this incompatibility. So then I think I have enough time here. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to point out too, um, we're looking at this in a hybrid context, not just a cybrid context. Um, and this is some preliminary um, information that we've uh, derived from that. So um, rather than enucleate the uh, oocyte, we uh, just do straightforward IVF and uh, utilize the oocyte of a zebrafish, fertilize with the uh, relative species, and then get a diploid hybrid um, to better understand the interspecies um, system what, with the both genomes at play here. So um, again, I bring up the, the hybrid uh, embryos that we derive from this. And um, further, we're interested in when they're adults, uh, how do how do these how does how do these uh, how does development and the uh, divergence of key factors play in the uh, development of um, or play in fertility in um, more so sterility um, and competency of these uh, fish later on. And so we're doing some initial studies looking at um, hybrid males in which we have identified a 25% reduction in, uh, in their testy size uh, in the area of their testes uh, in the uh, Daniel Margaritatis hybrids compared to the um, zebrafish controls. And then the sperm that are, uh, that are actually um, in those testes are, uh, there's some defects that we have identified in that too. So looking at the sperm with the structural protein of alpha tubulin and the uh, nuclei identifier in uh, DAPI, uh, you can see that in uh, Chiathid elboniatus, the close, more closely related species, it's it's pretty consistent. And um, while sperm concentrations are lower, the uh, sperm itself is uh, se seemingly um, and structurally uh, consistent with zebrafish. Whereas the Daniel margaritatus has some defects in that they have truncated sperm, but they also have um, this phenotype where the sperm is gets wound around itself, uh, around the uh, head um, indicated by the lower picture, um, which um, has implications in the fact that the indicating that the, the structural development of these sperm are um, defective and therefore would uh, lower and diminish the uh, fertility of these uh, hybrids. So, and then in just a context of concentrations, showing that the concentrations are, are lowered. And then one last point, and uh, I'll just say like, this isn't, uh, we, we do know it's, it's known that hybrids uh, are infertile in most contexts. And uh, I, I bring it up to say that uh, zebrafish can be a, a great a model to further study um, infertility in, um, in that, especially in an interspecific way. Um, and then just a final point here of uh, hybrids in that we've noticed that in the uh, hybrids in their larva or larvae, they, uh, they have a persistent range in growth. And what I mean by that is that there are some that grow to be quite large where others are, are like a, a micro uh, larvae. And that's not consistent with what we identify in um, zebrafish control. Zebrafish grow pretty uh, consistently, and I'll show it just here on a uh, uh, bell curve, they are pretty uh, tightly ranged within um, their size, uh, whereas the both Chiathid and Elbolineatus then 
and um, observed where there's uh, quite a range and this extends, I kind of cut off the, um, the graph here to kind of focus in on the nice tight bell curve of zebrafish, but um, this range is it's peculiar in the fact that uh, zebrafish don't have um, case or instance of imprinting or something like that where this has been reported in um, millions and it's definitely an area of um, interest to further study. But um, I'll just finish up here on the fact of we're utilizing the Danionin uh, lineage to interrogate these questions and better understand the molecular components that play roles in both the developmental context, um, but also these uh, interspecies systems. Um, and with that, I'd, I'd like to thank my lab, um, uh, my PI Francisco Plegri, um, my lab, uh, particularly people working on this, uh, are Caroline Berry, Trevor Chamberlain, uh, an undergraduate, Ben Veer, um, and then my thesis committee, of course, and my funding. Um, and yeah, with that, I'd love to take questions.